All righty, let's get started in our study. We'll be ending up this evening. We've been looking at uh, top 10 gardening tips in Eden. And uh, this is our second week to be doing so. Amen? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? what? Look at the sign. It's top 10 plus one. <laughs> This week, I was uh, I was doing some study and refreshing myself and getting ready, and pff, the Lord said, well, "What about this?" And I went, "Oh yeah, okay." So, so I don't want to change the sign to say top eleven, but let's say top ten plus one, and uh, we'll end up that way, okay? We did say, and we're not going to go into these; we're just going to list them. But uh, it was God's garden; He called it His, the garden of the Lord, or the garden of God, and it was planted by He Himself, by His his hands it was planted and made so it is a special special place now in our church we've I've taught my personal belief of course that everything in the Bible everything that we've encountered has something to do with the garden because the garden is God's perfect will and God's perfect place it's what he designed how he designed it how he wanted to relate to man and so everything has been about basically getting us back to a garden state yes. Amen? Amen. And so, uh, so everything that we talk about in the Bible, we can say, isn't that just like the garden? Isn't that just like the garden? Isn't that just like the garden? And so uh, it, it was his perfect place, his perfect state, and how he wanted to deal with us in, in his perfect plan. Okay? Yeah. Number two, we said that talking animals seem to be normal. Okay, we can infer that, wouldn't make a law about it, but the talking animals seem to be normal. Nobody be, seemed to be surprised when they spoke, okay? Uh, and I, uh, I think that um, on the videotape of this, sometimes I'll drop in some graphics that I don't think about when I'm teaching, but I actually have a plant with headphones on, you know, listening to, to music. Because I think that, uh, I honestly believe that the part of the work of Adam and Eve was to speak and give direction to the plants. I believe that they talked to the animals and that they talked to the plants and the plants because it says, now you're going to have to tend the garden by the sweat of your brow. But that means they were tending the garden before without the sweat of the brow. So I think that it was a verbal thing. I think that it was an encouraging thing. I think that when the Word talks about us being responsible for the words that we speak in the latter days, in our judgment days, that it goes back to the garden. To the garden, you see. That our words are quite important in what we say and how we say them. Say did not look like a snake when he was tempting Eve. He, uh, he, he did not lose his legs or wings or fins until afterwards. Because of this, you shall crawl on your belly, okay? They didn't eat an apple. I don't believe that they ate an apple. Um, there are apples in the Middle East. There are apples in the Middle East, uh, but they're not natural to that area um, at all. But that doesn't mean God couldn't have had apples in the garden. Right? I mean, I mean, after the flood, all kinds of things happen. But it has to do with the fact that anything that was bearing a seed was good for food. And apples certainly have seeds. And so that would not have been a restricted fruit for us because it had the seed. And then number five, Adam did live as a bachelor for either a day or hundreds of years, depending on how long it took him to name the animals. But he was a bachelor during that particular time. Number six, Adam and Eve had children before the fall. They had children before the fall because he said, now when you have childbirth, it's going to hurt. Well, what does that say about before then? They had childbirth, yeah, and that it was not in pain. And so they already had kids, already had kids when they fell. Um, and that then brings the question of, that we've referred to on two of these, and that is that they were probably in the garden for quite some time in our calendar in our time frame, this was, uh, this was, they were there, okay? The garden was not meant to be Adam and Eve's forever home. This is where we left off last week. We were about halfway through this particular teaching. So let's just look real quickly at our verses, okay? And get a running start on this. Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 28. I didn't get there, but let's do it. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Not fill the garden, but fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, can I tell you an, an impression, a feeling of mine that I can't support? 
I can't back it. I can't tell you this is the way it is. Okay? But in my world, I see that the garden was like a quiet time. You know, when you have a quiet time with the Lord, if you have a quiet time with the Lord and you have a Bible study with Him and you walk with Him and you talk with Him, and then when it's through, you got to go to work. Right? And you hope that you take some of the garden with you to work, don't you? And you might be a teacher and you might be a construction worker and you might be whatever you do. But then when you have a lunch break and you spend some time with God. To me, the garden was that repast of that time that they could go to and God would be waiting for them there. And then they went out and they did as he had assigned them to do within in the world. Uh, it doesn't mean that he wasn't with them. It doesn't mean anything like that. But out there was the assignment. That was the assignment. But in here was the relationship. This was, this was it. And because they did not have an indwelling Holy Spirit, they had the presence of God with them, that the garden was that presence with them. Now again, I can't tell you that chapter and verse, but to me this is how they operated during the day. This was their day. I don't think that they even slept in the garden. I think that when they were outside, that if they had family and they had children, they may have been outside the gate in, in, in a community of some kind. Um, wouldn't change it if they slept in the garden or if they didn't. Not Would it? Wouldn't change a lick. But in my little world, that's what I see. I see that they are uh, a civilization unto themselves of man who walk and commune with God. And it's how he wants it. Because that's kind of how I picture the end of days. That's how I, end, I see the new Jerusalem. That he's going to be there. We're going to be in his midst. But we're not always going to be just standing by the throne hanging on to his M. Because he has things for us to do. Yes, he does. You see, he's got things for us to do. And so as we do those things, we come back to him and his presence is there. Does that make sense? So anyway, I, I, take that for what it's worth, okay? Uh, Adam and Eve were given an assignment far beyond Eden itself. We did mention the word Pangea last week. This is an earthly uh, uh, theory. It's an earthly theory of how the world became the shape that it is, okay? And uh, some of you uh, knew Pangea, some of you did not, so I wanted to go a little deeper into it, because this is where we kind of left off, that scientists say that if you take the continents of the world, they fit together quite well as a little puzzle. That there may have been one continent, one land mass, in the beginning of time, um, and that it would have been easy then, basically, for Adam to have gone from one end to the other. It would have been quite simple. That it would have been a connected world. It would have been a connected world all together. But then, after the flood, once the wells sprung up from the deep, things changed. The whole uh, physical nature of the world changed. And so this little video is a... Is a uh, scientist view of how the world stretched and became the continents that we have today. Look at that little piece run up there and run into India and creates the Himalayas where they crush together. Now, their theory is as good as anything we've got, and our theory is as good as anything they've got, because it is theoretical. But at least the world may have been a lot more compact, a lot more contained before the flood, before all of this happened, and uh, it may have been their assignment to do a little bit of that, okay? And I, I can see how we can blend the, two, the science and the religion together in this area. Look at Genesis 3.24. What did you do at church? We learned about Pangea. Okay, what kind of a pagan church do you go to anyway? <laughs> so he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. This is when it gets real. This is, you're not coming back here for the rest anymore. You're not coming back for the relief that you have with me anymore. You're, you are now... Get this. You are now separated from me. And it's sin, right? And it is the separation that comes about. If we've had this relationship. 
and now that relationship has been broken. You used to come in the morning in your quiet time and talk to me. Not anymore. Not anymore. We can still talk, but it's not going to be in the perfect setting that I design. It's in the fallen design, right? And so I think it's interesting that the, remember, cherub is singular, cherubim is plural. So there's more than one angel hanging out at the door, okay? There's more than one. And, and, and uh, look at Ezekiel 1. I said last week that there could have been a, a hundred cherubs there. We don't know what the plural is. There could have been a whole host of angelic beings protecting God from man and man from God, keeping them separate. So Ezekiel 1, the fourth verse says, As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually, and a bright light around it, and in its midst something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and there was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, and their feet were like a calf's hoof, and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, were human hands. As for the faces and the wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. And as for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching another being and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, the lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Cherubim. Just like that. Just like that picture, right? No, that's not the description we get, is it? Look at Ezekiel 10. Look at Ezekiel 10. How many of you would like to run into one of these in a dark night in a street? <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Ezekiel 10, the first verse says, Then I looked and behold in the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, something like the sapphire stone, an appearance resembling a throne appeared above them. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen and said, Enter between the whirling wheels under the cherubim and fill your hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And he entered into my sight. Now the cherubim were standing on the right side of the temple when the man entered and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub to the threshold of the temple, and the temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of God. Moreover, the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer court, like the voice of God Almighty when He speaks. It came about when He commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from between the whirling wheels, from between the cherubim. He entered and stood beside a wheel. Then the cherub stretched out his hand from between the cherubim to the fire, which was between the cherubim, took some and put it into the hands of the one clothed in linen who took it and went out. The cherubim appeared to have the form of a man's hand under their wings. Then I looked and behold, four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like the gleam of Tarshish stone. As for their appearance, all four of them had the same likeness as if one one wheel were within another wheel. When they moved, they went in any of the four directions without turning as they went. But they followed in the direction which they faced without turning as they went. Their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, their wheels were full of eyes all around, and the wheels belonging to all four of them. The wheels were called in my hearing the whirling wheels, and each one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third was the face face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. Then the cherubim rose up. They are the living things that I saw by the river Kibar. 
Now when the cherubim moved, the wheels would go beside them. And when the cherubim lifted up their wings to rise from the ground, the wheels would not turn from beside them. When the cherubim stood still, the wheels would stand still. And when they rose up, the wheels would rise with them. For the spirit of the living beings was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. When the cherubim departed, they lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight with the wheels beside them. And they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house and the glory of Israel hovered over them. These are the living beings that I saw beneath the God of Israel by the river Kibar. So I knew they were cherubim. Absolutely. Whoa, mama. Don't tell me what I saw. So I'm telling you, and they're at the gate saying, entry not allowed. No entrance. No entrance. Not this kind of little critter, but this kind of critter. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. Stallone, look out. <laughs> Oh, the eyes on the wheels. God everywhere. <laughs> so with the cherubim, they're already scary enough, right? Uh -huh. But then they have with them the flaming swords that went every direction, every direction at once. Just imagine that there's a dozen of these cherubim at the gate. And the swords are going in every direction. And Adam and Eve stand there and say... We'll never get to go back in again. We're never going to get to go back in again. How many times do you think in their life that they walked by the gate and wondered if they could just do it all over again? Could I just get a second chance? I mean, the garden did not lift up and go to heaven. It stayed there, and they had to live near it, next to it, in the midst. And know you're banished. You're banned. You cannot get in. Number eight. We started out as vegetarians. And there's a good chance that we'll end up vegetarians. <laughs> So good chance that we'll end up vegetarians. We'll begin vegetarians, vegetarians, and we'll uh, end up vegetarians. In the beginning, Genesis one twenty-eight. Genesis one twenty-eight. God blessed them, and God said to them, "Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth." Then God said, "Behold." I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed and it shall be food for you. Now we looked at this and said it couldn't be an apple. But now we still look at it and say, but it is food. It is food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I've given every green plant for food and it was so. So the, all of the animals... We're vegetarian too. Mm -hmm. Every green plant was given to the lions, the tigers, and the bears to eat. Yep. Okay? And so that's the way that we began. That we began that way. However, when did we start eating meat then? Carnivores is a part of the Noah blessing and the Noah covenant. Look at Genesis 9. Genesis 9. Verses 3 and 4. Three, you call that the Noah, Noah Covenant. Yeah. It actually has a technical name called the Noahide Covenant. N-O-A-H-I-D-E. The Jews call it the Noah Covenant. Jews actually believe that if a Gentile follows the nine points of, is it nine or seven point, nine points of covenant with the Noah Covenant, that they will be saved. Again, they're doing it without a Messiah. They're doing it without a Christ. But they believe that if, if you are a, Jew, a Gentile and you follow the Noahide covenant, there are, I think, about 30 
congregations in the United States that, you know, you have Messianic yeah. covenants where, where Jews are following their Messiah. These are Christians who have converted to Judaism, basically, under the Noahide covenant, but they still call themselves Christians. And are. Yeah, they, they, they follow the Noahide Covenant. Uh, the problem with the Noahide Covenant is that it bypasses Christ as Redeemer. It becomes the law, that if you follow the law, you are redeemed. But, uh, yeah, there about, I think there's about 30, co three, 30 groups that I know. Um, and I know that because um, we had a dear friend who was part of the leadership of the movement. Okay. Uh, the... the uh, I've spoken years ago about Vendel Jones, the guy who found, who was looking for the Ark of the Covenant and the Indiana Jones movie was actually written. Kind of, the guy who wrote the screenplay was on one of his digs. Okay. And Indy Jones and Vindy Jones and all of that. But Vendel did find the only things that, are, that have, we know were used in the temple. He is the only archeologist that we know. He found the incense of the Holy Temple, it has the exact same chemical makeup, you know, uh, of that. He found the holy oil. He found a container of oil that is made up of the same, and three of the plants are now extinct, uh, that were in the container of the oil. Anyway, uh, we met Vendel in a hotel lobby, and the Lord told him to come talk to me. And I thought he just wanted money. I really did. You know, my, my American suspicion just went, uh -huh. and I thought, yeah, and you probably are a Nigerian prince, and you need money from a bank account <laughs> on the Internet, you know, but this was before the Internet. Um, I was incredibly suspicious of this guy, and I blew him off. And then I came home and studied his story and went, everything he told me is true. <laughs> Everything he's told me is true. And, and so I began to write to him. And although I did not agree with his theology, I really agreed with his archaeology. He, he, he was used of God in a special way. But anyway, he was a part, he was probably the major person in the United States to restore the Noahide covenant among Christians and Gentiles. And... Um, so, so we got up to our eyeballs in the formation of it, even though we didn't agree with it. We knew what was going on during all that. But anyway, the Noahide Covenant is one of the covenants, uh, one of the seven covenants that are in the Old Testament. Um, that God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And uh, that it's one of the random covenants, anyway, one of the standard covenants. Anyway, Genesis 9. Three and four, did we read that? Yeah. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. Every living, moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant in the garden. I'm giving you everything now. Only you shall not eat flesh that is life, that is its blood. Right. Okay, and so kosher uh, food has to be drained of all of its blood. Kosher meat has to be drained of its blood. Now, th there are... <laughs> In Galilee, in the Galilee area, which is the entire northern part of Israel, from the lake north up towards Lebanon, um, there are incredible cattle ranches now. And there are dude ranches. You can actually go up there and have, go to an Israeli dude ranch and ride horses and herd cattle just like you would in Montana or Wyoming in the United States. And, uh, and they are doing some really important beef production in Israel now. And we went to a couple of restaurants where when you walked in the front door to the restaurant were huge meat freezers or cabinet refrigerators where the meat was aging and there was like 40 day aged and 60 day aged meat and you know and I mean it was really serious Chicago chop house style steakhouses there and um, only, only for research did we have to participate in some of that, sure. because I needed to research the biblical aspect of Israel. But we had a, we had a couple of those stakes. And uh -huh, I'm sure you did. <laughs> well, am I glad God made us carnivores? Okay. <laughs> Woo, am I glad He did that? But uh, yeah, that was some really good stuff. Look at Leviticus six. Leviticus six twenty four to twenty nine. 
23 talks about grain offering of the priests shall be burned entirely, it shall not be eaten. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is slain, the sin offering shall be slain before the Lord. It is most holy. It is what? Most holy. Most holy. The sin offering. Getting rid of the sin. The priest who offers it for sin shall eat it. Yes. It shall be eaten in a holy place in the court of the tent of meeting. Anyone who touches its flesh will become cons consecrated and when any of its blood splashes on a garment in a holy place you shall wash what was splashed on. Also the earthenware vessel in which it was boiled shall be broken and it was boiled and if it was boiled in a bronze vessel it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It is most holy. holy. Okay, But no sin offering to which any of the blood is brought into the tent of meeting to make atonement in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burned with fire. So I just bring this up to say that although we were designed to be vegetarians, God did open it up to the meat. And it was not like a second chance that said you should eat vegetables over meat because it was a blessing for man to eat the meat and for the priest to do so. Yes. So it's one of those concessions that God has made where after the, after the flood he said, I'm going to give you everything to eat with no restrictions whatsoever. Okay? Now, look at Acts 10. Acts 10, the ninth verse. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat, but while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a giant sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. So he grabbed and strangled the broccoli. Oh, my way. No, I have no broccoli to strangle. What? He, he stomped on a carrot till it was dead. Uh, okay. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. So please, do we have to have our vegetables? Yes. Do we eat enough vegetables? Probably not. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's not make a dogma and a doctrine over vegetarianism and Christianity. God said, I've given you everything. And if he gave us everything, then in moderation is the answer to everything. Okay? And so let's not make a, a doctrinal stand, a dogmatic stand, that it was that way in the garden and should be that way. He gave us everything. He gives. Amen. Yeah, pardon. Amen. <laughs> you, you've come so close to my heart and belly. But anyway, uh, <laughs> now here we get into a question. When I was in college, when I was in college, my uh, one of my professors. We were all young, you know, we're just high schoolers in our first year of college, and one of my theology professors said. How many of you preacher boys believe in evolution? Well, I mean, not one hand went up. <laughs> one hand would have gone up. We would have beaten him to a pulp, you know, just, uh -huh. no, we don't believe in evolution. He said, how many of you have canine incisors? So I did. He said, um, Adam didn't. Well, they didn't have any need for a tearing tooth back then. It was all it That's it. He didn't need a meat, meat, a meat tooth. We didn't need a meat tooth till after the flood. Hello. So he said, did we evolve or not? And I learned an incredibly important lesson that unfortunately our world still has not learned 60 years later, 50 years later, however old I am. We still haven't learned this, that there is a difference between evolution and adaptation. Boy, is there, yeah. There's a difference. And I'm here to tell you that being in the academic community, the evolutionary world knows it. And if you watch Smithsonian, if you watch science, if you watch National Geographic, they are now using the word evolution to describe adaptation. Oh, really? 
I'm telling you, I saw it about 20 times in the past couple of weeks of lockdown watching National Geographic specials. Okay. Okay. We got that Disney. Yeah. We got that Disney Plus, which got the National Geographic. We got the Disney yeah. Plus so that Kate could watch some of those things. But I like the National Geographic stuff. And I'm telling you, show after show after show after show after show, the word adaptation was never used, but the word evolution was. And I went, that's not evolution. That's not evolution. Evolution is the transference or the evolving from one species to another okay the missing link and all of that and coming from monkeys and cousins and all that listen the scientific community knows that that does not work anymore i did record an hour special and made Carol watch part of it. She's not all that crazy about some of those things. And, and I said, watch this, watch what they do, watch what they do here. And they said, we no longer believe that we all came from a single amoeba. We no longer, there's no scientific evidence that we all came from a single amoeba. But we're cousins of one another. Now, they never explained where the cousins come from if there wasn't one amoeba <laughs> that we all came from, uh -huh. where there are a bunch of amoebas and some of them had fur and fins and feathers. I mean, they could not explain that. You cannot explain the ridiculous. No. Yeah. And evolution is ridiculous, okay? You cannot explain the unexplainable and the absurd. Mm -hmm. To say that God created man and animals is so absurd they say but it takes so much less faith and science to understand that than it does to believe that we have all that we have from a single amoeba okay. <laughs> right one is logical one is illogical and they've made black white and white black okay but here's the deal adaptation is real adaptation is built into our world adaptation is built into our body if we go live in the cold long enough we get adapted to the cold if we live in the desert long enough we become adapted to the desert we know that if you look at the skulls of the ancient native americans of the oldest Native Americans, they all had ground down teeth because they ground their corn with stone and the stone got in the corn and it acted like sandpaper and they ground their teeth down. They got missing teeth and they got flat teeth from it, right? Adaptation is real. Evolution is not. But they know that evolution now is ridiculous and so they're trying to use the word evolution for adaptation so that they can cover themselves and say, well, that's what we meant all along. You do understand it. No, it's not. It's not what they meant all along. They're covering themselves, okay? This is what an herbivore looks like. This is a horse. He's got flat teeth. Why? He's got to crush the grain. He's got to munch and crush the grain, and he's got to break it down, and he has no need for a meat-tearing incisor whatsoever. This one does. Yeah, you do. This one has prey on the ground. He bites it. He pulls it. He rips it. He tears it apart. Barely chews it. You know, they barely got any molars. They dissolve in the stomach. They don't chew it. Honey, chew your gazelle 20 times before you swallow. Yeah. Chew your gazelle 20 times before you swallow or else you'll have a tummy ache later. That does not happen in the tiger and the lion world, does it? They chomp, they chew, they swallow. That's what happens. Well, guess what? We have one. It is not evolution. It is adaptation. That once we had the ability and the freedom to eat meat, then God adapted our world to be able to eat meat. So, tear your broccoli with it if you want to, that's okay. But again, moderation is the word. Moderation is the word. Um, you know, if you go back to the beginning of the American diet at the pre Revolutionary War, farms were hard to grow, deer were easy to kill. Okay? They were a meat eating people, they weren't a bunch of vegetarians. We've. we've you know, aborted the whole thing because of our lifestyle. Now, I do think that probably fast food is an abortion of our lifestyle, but I'm still going to eat $5 buckets from Kentucky Fried Chicken. But see, the, there's the incisor. There's, there's the cross between those two, isn't it? We, we, have, we do have, we have a, did you know that the tooth just behind, find your canine. Find your canine, that little sharp thing there, and right behind it's a molar. The first tooth is a molar. 
which is a crunching, grinding tooth, you see? And so you got all of that, and then you've got that, and we look like that. So we started out as vegetarians. We became meat eaters. We, we started out as vegetarians, which is an herbivore. We became omnivores, which means you eat both. And a carnivore doesn't like to eat any kinds of grains or vegetation, and they eat just meat. Okay, so we are an omnivore. We eat them both because of adaptation. Boy, don't you, aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Now, how about in the end times? In the end times. Look at Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, 6 and 7 says, And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Graze, yeah. They're going to graze. Bears wouldn't graze today, but they will. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. Now, either this is incredibly symbolic and metaphorical, or it's what it's going to be. And what does it mean? We're all going back to the garden. It's going to be the garden again. It's what happened in the garden before the fall, and the end of the new Jerusalem will be the restoration of the garden, and we will walk with him and talk with him in his midst, and God will say, this is how I designed it. This is how I planned it. And God will sit on his throne and say, and I always get my way. Yes, you do, Lord. I always get my way. Amen? That respect, yes, sir. When, when he says, my ways are not your ways, just remember, he always gets his way. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. That's the way he, he always gets it, okay? Look at Isaiah 65. Chapters and chapters later, he finished, He comes back to the same story. The wolf and the lamb will graze together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. We're going back to the garden. We're going back. It's going to be like it was. Yeah. It said, let him eat the dirt. Let him eat dirt. Number nine, number nine. There was a prophecy that was given at the fall. Look at Genesis 3. Verse 14 says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and... You'll eat. What did we just read? Yeah, yeah the dust going to be his food. And he, in other words, the rest of us get to the, go to the garden, but he doesn't. Mm -hmm. he He's still under the curse. Thank you. The devil is still going to be under the curse when we're not. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to eat dust until his end time. All the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. In other words, there's going to be a problem between the devil and the woman forever. There's going to be a problem between the devil and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, he. Now look at that. Devil, your offspring... And Eve, your offspring. Yes. And then it says the word he. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So the prophecy of Christ coming is actually given in a pronoun of he. He, yes, please. It, no, it's he. It is, a, it is a personal pronoun. It is a very, very personal male pronoun of he. Uh, let's see. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And so Satan may be referred to an it, but Jesus is not going to be. He's the he there, okay? And so this prophecy is given at the fall that, you know what? You're being kicked out of the garden. Our relationship is broken. But I always get my way. I always get my way. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all just go out there and sweat a while. I'll be back. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. There will be a day, Satan, when you're going to bite him on the heel. 
and he's just going to go, ow. Stop it. Yeah, raise your head, okay? So there was a prophecy given right there at the fall that has been fulfilled. Number 10, not only Adam and Eve fell. Okay, Genesis 3.14. We just go back to the same phrase, Genesis 3.14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all So the cattle were cursed. The Satan got cursed more than the cattle, but the cattle got cursed. And more than any of the, every beast of the field. In other words, they're cursed, but not as much as Satan. In other words, when Adam and Eve fell because they had dominion of the planet, the planet that they had control of fell with them everything fell all the animals and this is why we say that until the fall there were no thorns there were no thistles there no, were no stickers there were no stickers on bushes but when those plants fell they lived the curse too mm -hmm. the, that's right goat heads and, and boy do we fight them on this two and a half acres over here I'll tell you and in our playground back there for our kids we come in and their socks look like they're fuzzy but uh, we're, we're working on it we're trying it but you're right none of that happened until the fall but folks when Adam and Eve fell because he had given them dominion over it because it was theirs to have everything that they had fell with them and that's why when he says, and your seed, we are born with a sin nature. We are born with that flaw. We're born with it. Yes, sir. We're born with that. We have the inclination to sin. Okay? Now somebody asked me one time when I was teaching on the sin nature and we were doing a long, deep study on the sin nature and uh, and they said, what about babies? What about babies that are born? I mean, folks, babies are born with a sin nature. Yeah, they are. You don't have to spend much time around a baby to know that they're not angels. Right? They're selfish and they're self-serving and they are, they have a sin nature in them. But remember, we're not held responsible for the sin that we commit until we can recognize it and repent of it. Once I, and so this is where we get into that. Everybody wants to have rules. Everybody wants to have regulations. The Jews. Thou shalt not work on the Sabbath day. Thou shalt keep it holy. Right. Well, what's work? Well, work is going to work. So I can't go to work. No, you shouldn't go to work. Okay. Well, what about the guy who works at home? Well, he shouldn't do that either. Okay. And so, if I have to go 100 steps to get to work, and he goes 50 steps to get to work, is he working or am I working? How many steps is it to work? Well, let's work that out. Okay. And then, and women said, what do we chop liver? We're cooking food. We're making fires. We're cleaning pots. You don't call that work? Well, of course that's work, yes. And so, okay, so you can't cook on the Sabbath day, and you can't start a fire on the Sabbath day, and you have to have the sticks that are already flamed up, and you have to cook your food and keep it warm, but then even serving the food could be work, waiters or waitresses. And so, oh my, we've got to explain what is work, what is work, and let's define it, and let's do all, all of that. So here we can get into the same kind of a quagmire, can we not? when we talk about the fall of everything and how far it fell and what all of that means. And, but what we're really saying is the entire planet fell. So where is the age of accountability? Is it at five? Is it at six? Is it at ten? You know, God calls every person to himself individually and personally okay and so if he calls each and every one of us individually and personally then he knows when it's a sin he knows when I need to be repenting not me it's not important that I judge when someone should repent and be out of sin but it's very important that he does because he's the one that's going to hold him accountable right so let's not sweat the small stuff Let's just say that we know 
than babies or in the arms of a loving God. Because they cannot know of their sin, therefore they cannot be held accountable of their sin, and they cannot repent of their sin. Now, this opens another door of discussion of what about the pygmies in Africa who don't know if it's a sin or not? I mean, you know, they're up running around naked and eating things they shouldn't, doing stuff they shouldn't. But they, they've never been to seminary. They've never been to the West. They've never heard of a Western preacher. They've never heard the gospel. They've never heard all that. Well, guess what? He's not coming back till everybody has. So let's not worry about it, okay? Amen. I am one of those that believe that the world was pretty much evangelized by the second century. I think I could make a case for the fact that the Christianity spread. I mean, the people in Africa are incredibly excited about the fact that they have the Ark of the Covenant because Solomon had babies with Queen Sheba, and they see themselves as more Jewish and Christian than the rest of the world. Now, where did they get that from if they hadn't heard? You see, the word has already been to Africa. What they did with it is kind of up to them. The word's been to Europe. What they did with it is kind of up to them. The word has been to China and been to the Orient. What they did with it is kind of up to them. Yes, sir. But I know of the revivals of the China Inland Mission. I know of the word of the Lord that has gone in, in different missionary movements. Most of the world's already heard. The 40 days that I spent in Papua New Guinea. They still practice Papua New Guinea. Yeah, they still practice cannibalism. They still practice witchcraft. They still worship demons. They they're going after it seriously over there. But did you know in their charter they call themselves a Christian nation? Really? Their charter is as a Christian nation. It is in their charter and constitution. Why? Because they were Christianized in the 1700s. Now what they did with it since is up to them. I really believe the Lord would come back any time because I think the Word has been around the world. I think the gospel's already been around the world. Amen? Amen. 